Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back. We're going to get started in just a moment. Um, while, we're, while you're settling in, I'll do a little warm up for you here. Um, I hope you agree we had a very informative morning, very, very interesting discussion that really laid the groundwork in terms of what's going on in the industry. Mentioned some opportunities, but certainly, I think it was a very frank discussion, talked very much too about the challenges that are out there. And indeed, like in any industry, tremendous challenges without a doubt. But they, then again, I think when we look at this industry, and particularly when we look at the energy sector, it is without a doubt the most important sector, I would say, in the globe. And I, I throw that line out there occasionally, and people then say, no, finance is more important, health is more important, blah, blah. And I'm like, sorry, if we turn the switches off, guys, it's all over. So the tremendous potential that is there, particularly for the energy sector, when you look down the road and you look at population growth, you look at the growth of a stronger middle class, you look at the growth of more disposable income, all of that, and also then the demand for consumer goods and the demand for more sustainable consumer goods. Because there's no point trying to, to put the brakes on economic development, and we're not going to be able to put the brakes on population growth. This is going to happen, the predictions are there, but it's also about making sure that people live a happy life, a comfortable life, and a, and a life of abundance. And there's absolutely no reason why all of the resources should not be there if these resources are well managed, well taken care of, and preserved for generations to come. And I think the bioeconomy has certainly the answers for that. Someone this morning was asking about the potential for growth in this sector, talking about the fact that they might only be a small player at the moment. You know, hey, it's great to be a small player in this sector because uh, the fact you are a player in this sector is very, very important. And when you look at the general mood of society and the shift towards a greener, more sustainable, renewable future, you know, you're certainly on the right road. You've got a great story to tell. And just in a short while, we're also going to hear from some journalists in terms of how perhaps you can tell that story a bit better, because maybe it's not getting out there. And that's certainly some of the feeling we're getting at the moment. But more importantly, let's get this afternoon session underway. We're going to talk about investment in the bioeconomy. And again, looking at it from, from a niche to a norm. And once again, I think we look at the big investment banks where maybe 10 years ago, they didn't really have you in their sights. I can tell you now, it's, uh, they're, they're really shifting their sights. And we look at some of the big investment funds that are pulling away from fossil fuel investments. And we also look at some of the traditional oil companies. And we've got to embrace them in many ways. They've brought us a long way. And um, I don't think we'd be here today having this conversation were it not for them, be that right or wrong but we have to give them some credit for the development there has been. And now we have to look at where they are. They're in a position where they know they're within this transformation and they're, they're a little worried, and rightly so. And what they're doing in this too, we're hearing their narrative has very, very, it's shifted very much. You look at the big oil players, they're all getting involved, not all of them, but some of them, you know, getting involved in biofuel. They have the money. The oil price is getting up there a little bit more, so they might have more next time. So again, I think it's time to perhaps embrace the expertise that they have, the will that they have of being part of the solution, of having to be part of the solution, because they don't have a choice anymore. So a lot has changed. And once again, I just say it's a great time for the bioeconomy. But more important is we're going to hear from some of the some of the money brokers. These are the important guys because if the money is not there, this is not going to happen. This can't be a charitable endeavor. It has to be something that uh, is going to be good for society, good for environment, and yes, it must make money too. This must be a profitable, profitable business for people involved. So let's welcome our panel and um, get this started. From the European Investment Bank, Vice President Alexander Stubb joins us. Alexander is in the house, he's here. Thank you very much. If you can maybe take a seat here. Wonderful. We're going to really look forward to what you have to say there. I'm holding that middle seat for Sasha, so you'll be perfectly happy there. From the Metza Group, the President and CEO, Carrie Jordan. Carrie, please join us. Thank you so much. And we've seen some of your great work. You're going to disappear. <gasps> wow. This is, this is new. 
Not sending a hologram, I'm thinking it's just going to disappear. But we're very happy that you're here to join us for this. Maybe you want to sit on the side in that case, and then we'll maybe get you an easy exit. Um, we will miss you, but uh, we're happy you're here at least for this. It's very important. Mm -hmm. And from Lanza Tech, the CEO, Jennifer Holmgren. So Jennifer, great. Thank you so much. Now, of course, to moderate and chair this session, a gentleman who has 15 years investment experience and really a passion for this sector and really believes the financial sector plays a critical and crucial role in reaching a sustainable future. So a very warm welcome for Sasha Beltic, the head of sustainable finance for Nordia Funds. So I leave it to you, Sasha. Thank you so much. And to all our panelists, we're really looking forward to this and I hope we have time for a few questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, uh, enabling us to be here today. It's a great conference. I've spent uh, three days, four days in Paris this week uh, meeting uh, all the financial players in the world, discussing a subject that was unthinkable five years ago, and that's sustainable finance. And most of these guys that I met in during these three, four days were actually talking about the new revolution in the financing where the bioeconomy is a big part of that. And I'm happy to have this fantastic uh, panel here. Uh, and before introducing the panel, uh, Kari will have to leave after his short presentation, so we apologize for that. Uh, and maybe we can start with uh, Alexander. Alexander is a fantastic and fascinating person. I mean, I read so much about you before I came here, and both the sportsman, but also with the fantastic experience. Uh, you're gonna talk about the bioeconomy from sort of a more technological, if I understood you correctly, perspective, sort of a revolutionary angle of this, what is going to happen in a framework of the next couple of years. So please, Alexander, the word is yours. Okay, thanks. From there or here? Yeah, whatever you choose, whatever you like. Okay, perhaps it's, well, um, it's probably easier to start. Yeah. Thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Very nice to see all of you here. Um, it's really nice to be sort of introduced as a banker. <laughs> Everyone in this room knows me as a serious banker, a real guru, an expert in financial markets and other things, uh, with no gift of the gab and no political background whatsoever. Uh, it, it is really nice to be here. And what I thought I'd do is uh, I'll give a little bit of an introduction. Then I will basically try to divide what I have to say into two points. Not three today. Uh, and, and the first one will be basically an elevator pitch on the EIB on why I think that you guys should seek finance from us. And the second one uh, is my two cents worth on uh, the bioeconomy. But before I start, and by way of introduction, I was trying to think how best to put this into perspective. Uh, and this is what I came up with. Um, go back 100 years and think, you know, bioeconomy. You know, no one spoke of that, you know, agriculture and perhaps a little bit of forestry and the rest of it. Not only that, put yourself into the shoes of a horse. Now, can you think of a horse a hundred years ago, right? Now what does a horse do? It works out in the farms, it works out in the forest, and it really has a tough life. Now a hundred years on, think about the life of that horse. You know, that horse actually gets transported in a car <laughs> from place A to B, and if things go well, that car is fueled by horse shit. <laughs> and that is just to give you a perspective of, of, of how things change. And my big point today is, is, for all of you who are here present today, is to have a really open mind uh, to change in, in, in general. And it's not only going to be about technological change. The industrial fourth industrial revolution is not only about uh, digitalization, robotization, 3D printing, artificial intelligence of it, or Internet of Things. It's about changing business models. And I'm sure that Kari, when he talks about the bioeconomy, will give you a good sense of how the business model of his company, for instance, uh, has changed. So my Two points today. The first one is on the European Investment Bank, which is based in Luxembourg. Uh, many of you might have heard of it, but few of you know that it's actually the biggest multilateral bank in the world. 
It's three times bigger than the World Bank. It's ten times bigger than the EBRD. It's one of these best-kept European secrets. 90% of our business happens inside the borders of the EU and 10% outside the EU. But just to give you a couple of figures, uh, our assets or balance is 600 billion euros, capital 250 billion, and we use and give out financial instruments, loans per annum, approximately 80 billion euros. And that is usually leveraged three or four fold. And just to put it into perspective, the EU annual budget is about 125 to 150 billion euros, depending on the year, but those are direct grants. We give these out as financial instruments, which are then leveraged. And the reason that we're able to be on the market is that we are a AAA rated institution, because we're owned by 28 sovereigns, so 28 uh, member states. So people trust us. And whenever we go into an investment, usually it crowds in other investors as well. So if you are in the business of the bioeconomy, and if you are into investing, probably one of the first home pages that you should go on uh, is ours. And if you want to look at the guy who runs it from here in Finland, Jukka Lokanen, who's going to stand up and wave, uh, with both hands. Uh, so crowd him uh, after I've spoken. One more word on the EIB uh, is that we basically uh, finance and focus finance on, on four sectors. The first one is very broad, I admit, small and medium-sized business. That's a little bit less than half of what we do. But the three other sectors are a little bit more specific. One of them is infrastructure. So big infrastructure projects. When you flew into the Helsinki airport, which has extremely good snow how, um, you will have probably passed in a terminal which had been financed uh, by the European Investment Bank. If you took the train in from downtown, you will have taken a train, a couple of stations of which have been financed by uh, the uh, EIB. The third sector is innovation, in which we look very carefully nowadays. And then the fourth sector is environment and climate. And if you look at environment and climate, uh, and you can put bioeconomy in there, that's about 25% of, of the business that we do. So we're very much a bank of, of good news. And our DNA, or system of working, has changed. In the olden days, it would not necessarily have been necessary for me to come here, because the loans that we provided were so big. Our average loan was 100 million euros. And if you're a small and medium-sized company, it's not exactly like you're going know, to come knocking on the door of the EIB and say, please, give us 100 million euros at good rates. But because of what we call the Juncker Plan, or EFSI, the European Fund for Strategic Investment, we now get involved in much riskier business and much smaller, bu much smaller business through different types of instruments, which uh, I'll get into in a second. So the bottom line is that we, I think, not only have an excellent reputation, uh, but we are a good bank to work with. But I want to stress, we're not a bank of grants. We're not in the business of, of altruism. We're just a bank which is pretty safe and sound because our non-performing loans are probably the lowest in the world at 0.4%. So we're a good bank to do business with. So that's my elevator pitch uh, as an EI, EIB uh, vice president. My second point then today is, is, is the investment bit. Now, I've always found in the beginning that bioeconomy as such is, is sort of a you know, difficult one to define. I'll have to switch this a little bit to Finnish for one second. The Finns will understand this. In Finnish, you can either say biotalous or biotallous. If it's biotalous, you're more business oriented. If it's biotallous, it's probably more agriculture oriented. But I think we should get away from you know, this type of a definition, uh, which I think is, is quite old-fashioned. Yes, biomass for energy, electricity, heat, and fuel, that is part of the bioeconomy. Yes, products such as paper and cardboard are short-term bioeconomy products, but also long-term bioeconomy products, furniture and, and buildings. 
But think about it more in terms of new products. I don't understand why, for instance, when we talk about the bioeconomy, can't we at the same time talk about physics, chemistry, <coughs> or medicine, for that matter? Because I think that we are in the midst of a technological or whatever revolution you want to call, whereby the materials that we use can in many ways be defined as bioeconomy. So don't think of bio as, you know, a forest. <laughs> it's a hell of a lot more uh, than that. You know, we're going to be driving in cars, which basically are going to have bio type of elements uh, in them. And I'm not only speaking about biofuels. We as human beings will most probably be eating either gene manipulated or otherwise foods which are bio-based, but not in the traditional bio world. So, so we really need to think broadly when we think about um, uh, the bio uh, economy. Now, in the EIB, we basically have two instruments, if I were you, that I'd, I'd look at. One is the one I already mentioned, EFSI, the European Fund for Strategic uh, Investment. And the other one is what we call InnovFin. These are the two sort of avenues that you want to look at uh, if you're coming to look at different types of uh, investment uh, opportunities. We then have, of course, tens of different products, but four main products that, that we work with. The first one are project loans, both to the private and the public sector. So that's basically us giving you a loan. And let me tell you, our loan officers, lawyers, engineers, scientists, uh, and risk managers, they're tough people to deal with. Uh, it's not always fun when you're sitting on the other end of the investment, but they're very particular in their due diligence. So that's when we give out a direct uh, loan. Uh, the second instrument is what we call framework loans, and that's basically co-financing. So we come in uh, with another party to do uh, the financing or the loan. The third one is intermediary loans. So we go through a particular bank. So for instance, in Finland here, we just signed an S SME initiative, 150 million euros with four banks. And we basically provide the guarantee, half of it, so that the bank can go out and loan. And there, you know, it really varies. When I went to uh, OPE, one of the banks, I heard that the smallest loan that they had given was to baby swimming, the concept of baby swimming for 20,000 euros. And the largest ones then go up to uh, a few tens of millions of euros. So the instruments are certainly much more risky and much more varied than what they used to be. And then, of course, the fourth instrument is the European Investment Fund, or EIF, which is part of our group, which is then more uh, equity and, and microfinance based. Now, when we started the field uh, of the bioeconomy. We, we did a study, I don't know if it's been distributed here, uh, but if you bump into it, just look it up, we'll give you the references. Um, there, there were a few problems which were linked to the access of finance. Uh, the first problem was, was uh, private access, because the feeling was that this is actually quite a high-risk field. That a lot of times, uh, when you get into from a pilot to a demo, you know, it's difficult to get funding for that. Or then when you go from a demo to an industrial scale. But that's where a bank like the EIB can help, because we're not only about lending and blending, we're also about advising. So if you need advice on what the regulatory framework is, or if you need advice on what kind of investment are available, that's, you know, why the European Investment Bank exists and, 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 and what we are uh, uh, for. So we give you both advice on the regula and regulatory support and we, we can do some of the market risk uh, analysis uh, for you. So the bottom line is that we do have a lot of products and I will finish off by concluding uh, that the EIB is trying to be as active as possible in this field. Obviously, as in every bank, you have different views. Some people want to focus on other things. I want to focus personally on innovation, uh, on uh, bioeconomy. And I do think that you really need to think big when you are in this field. Keep an open mind. And let me just finish off with a little thought for you. Um, 
A lot of people talk about the future of work linked to technological development and the fears and worries that we have about it. Don't go back a hundred years to the horse I told you about, but go back a 2,000 years to Plato and to Socrates. And think about if they would now wake up and come into this room and they would ask, what are you guys doing here? I said, we're working. What do you think they would think? For them, work was the spade and the shovel. For them, this would be just fun. So when you think about the bioeconomy and when you're working here, think big, think progressive, because this is a field of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. It was a great, great, uh, great introduction into this field. And now I have a pleasure to introduce uh, Kari uh, Jordan, President and CEO of METSE Group. And Kari, please. And he will tell us uh, more about the way how METSE Group is developing and evolving its business model, which is broadening sort of a perspective of how I think both externally and internal stakeholders are looking at the way how they develop their business. So, Kari, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm an ex-banker. <laughs> I've been banking for 26 and a half years before I joined Forest Industry about 13 and a half years ago. So, so uh, just a word of, of uh, uh, analysis on, on what Alex was saying. In this project I'm going to describe to you, uh, EIB has been part of. And, and, and let me just give some very, very high remarks on, on their professionals, how, how they, they were performing, included in, 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 in the financial picture of this process. And uh, so it was, it was really very, very good indeed. So, so that was before my time, so. Yeah. <laughs> At least you haven't been spoiling it. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be here today and present Metze Group and the largest forest industry investment in Europe, Anekoski Bioproduct Mill, to you. And I also take the opportunity to thank European Forest Institute for organizing this event and for uh, the invitation to speak here. In my presentation, I'm going to tell you a bit about Metze Group, what is Metze Group, what's been happening over there during the last years, and then most of the time I'm spending with, with this Anekoski. Middle. Uh, first of all, what is Metze Group? It's a forest industry company uh, where parent company is Metze Little Cooperative. Uh, owners are about 100,000 100, uh, forest owners, so cooperative uh, based. And um, these guys own the owners uh, about half of the private Finnish forest land. And that is a good source of, of raw material to, to our industry. So uh, we in uh, Metsa Group, we focus on production services with promising growth prospects and in which we have strong competence and competitive edge. Those are sort of must. So what you can see over there, we have five different Business areas, first of all, Metsa Forest is responsible for supplying wood, so wood procurement is their business. Then we have um, Metsa Fiber, that's focusing on pulp and sawn timber. Then Metsa Wood in wood products, that means plywood and, and laminated veneer lumber, LVL. Metsa Board, fresh fiber paper boards, falling box board and liner. And then Metsa Tissue, tissue and cooking paper. So that's Metsa Group today. So, uh, but it's today, it was not 13 years ago, we have implemented a major transformation in, in the group uh, because the first decade of this millennium was challenging due to the massive decline of printing and pr writing paper demand. It started in North America around year 2000 and ex expanded eventually to Europe around the year 2005. At the time, uh, Metsa Group was one big European uh, paper manufacturer with 5.5 million tons capacity, which corresponded about maybe 13% Europe of European capacity. And we decided to turn around the company, uh, transform the company completely. So we started heavy restructuring in 2005, 
and that was a wise decision from our perspective. Since 2005, printing and writing paper demand has declined some 35-40%. So 35-40% down from that time in Europe. So a big, big change indeed. So we sold, we closed, disposed, and the last paper reel was manufactured in July 2016. So a long process, but it's gone, it's done, empty. So at the beginning of the restructuring, uh, the company was of the size of about 8 billion, 8.5 billion euros in turnover. Uh, we had net debt horrendously. At the moment, about 5 billion, uh, and our net debt is, is really, you know, down to figures uh, which are very, very much understandable, even after this Anikoski 1.2 billion investment. So one-fourth of net debt nowadays compared to what we had back in 2005. And profitability, of course, it's, it's on a totally different level. So now we are focusing on growing our core businesses. During 2015, 16, 17, we are investing about 2 billion euros uh, lion's share here in Finland. Uh, that includes, of course, some paperboard production in Sweden. Uh, wood production capacity increase Finland and Estonia, efficiency improvements on large scale, and then of course Anikoski Bioproduct Mill. And now I'm going to Anikoski Bioproduct Mill. What were the drivers behind Anikoski investment? First of all, the life cycle of the old Anikoski Mill. So we have had a pulp mill in there since 1953. Uh, but the mill, which was built in 19, or completed in 1986, was coming to the end of its life cycle. So we needed to do something. And then, furthermore, there is a sound demand for Nordic long fiber pulp in the market, so we needed more capacity. So we con conducted a comprehensive analysis back in 2012-2013 and a profound pre-feasibility study and came to the conclusion that we go ahead. Some major things that come up uh, through our analysis was that, first of all, growth of long fiber pulp demand seems to be continuing steadily also years to come. Uh, and then wood availability in Finland seemed to be adequate. So then was just the moment to think about what kind of mill we are going to, to build. And we decided not to rebuild uh, the existing or expanding the old mill. Instead, we wanted to build a completely new one in order to achieve clear performance improvement, including energy and environmental efficiency. And those have been completed. So we, we decided to build the world's best mill in its field. Furthermore, from day one, it was clear that uh, we didn't want to uh, build only a just a pulp mill. Uh, it had to be something different. Uh, so the new high-tech unit was decided to be called a bioproduct mill because the share of bioenergy and other bioproducts was much higher from the very beginning than ever before. The new mill started exactly four months ago, 15th of August, and it was constructed, note this, in line with original timetable and within the budget. Original timetable and original budget. So a few facts about the mill. First of all, efficiency and cost competitiveness is best in class, of course. The best available technology means that you have the best competitiveness and efficiency. Annual pulp production is about 1.3 million tons, and nominal capacity will be reached by summer next year. It uses 6.5 million cubic of round wood annually, and no fossil fuels are used. The mill employs directly about 150 people, and in the whole value chain, uh, outside the fences, about 2,500 uh, 2, people, including 1,500 new jobs, new permanent jobs. Electricity self-sufficiency is considerably high at 240%, so we are 
delivering a lot of green energy to a national grid. So it generates about 2.5% of all electricity, 2.5% units of all electricity in this country. And the pulp that is a basic product, you know, uh, is imp imported to both Europe and, and the Far East. So demand for forest industry products is growing globally thanks to population growth, higher standard of living and sustainability requirements, and therefore need for pulp is, is growing. That goes for short fiber and, 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 and this Nordic long fiber that we are talking about now. In my mind, uh, current products in current form and, 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 and also further developed will be the mainstream in the future, but there will be a wide range of new products complementing the offering. Uh, bioenergy, biochemicals, various applications where food, wood fiber replaces fossil fuel based materials. So that will be the future. So basic current products will be the big volume and on top of that there will be a lot of new products, uh, uh, new innovations coming to the market in the future. Finnish wood raw material must be used 100%. This is one of the core ideas of our bioproduct concept. The best in class pulp mill is the heart of the whole bioproduct mill, a network of operations and companies manufacturing various types of bioproducts will grow around it. Pulp production side streams are converted into bioproducts that offer higher added value, uh, higher added value than before. The ecosystem created by the bioproduct mill is unique in the world. The goal, as said earlier, is for the bioproduct mill not to, not to generate any landfill waste, i.e. we use wood fiber 100%. The traditional products include high quality pulps, tal oil, turpentine, bioenergy products. As new products, I highlight product gas from bark, so we gasify bark, sulfuric acid, so we capture sulfur from, from uh, smoke and, and fumes, uh, methanol from odorous gases, biogas from sludge, and bio, uh, biocomposites from pulp. So a variety of, of new products is, is, is quite big already, and it goes further. Other potential bioproducts include, for example, textile fibers and lignin products. We are studying several processes and product paths and will implement them gradually. Then a few words about the mill's significant impact to the Finnish economy. Most numbers on this slide are based on a study made by the Research Institute of the Finnish Economy, ETLA. Uh, first of all, domestic content of the whole mill is roughly 70%, slightly above 70%. Thanks to the middle Finnish exports, annual exports will increase by half a billion euros, so all the increment we are exporting. During the construction phase, revenue of companies operating in Finland increased by two and a half billion euros, and the value added increased by nearly one billion euros. The annual employment impact, uh, annual, uh, annual employment impact in the construction phase was about 4,000 many years. So a sizable, sizable thing. During the production phase, the revenue in Finland increases by over 30 billion, billion euros, and the value added by 12 billion euros. Employment impact in total is over 61,000 man years. The mill diversifies the Finnish forest industry sector. It supports Finland in reaching its goal for renewable energy as it increases the share of re renewable energy in Finland by approximately 2.5% units, as said earlier. Wood supply for the mill is supported by Metsalito Cooperative's extensive membership base as well as the fact that uh, the, uh, the location of the new mill is, is very central uh, in Anekoski, which is a, uh, I would say, the best growing uh, forest area, you know, in this country. The byproduct mill impacts wood supply in the whole country. Most of the wood comes from within the radius of 150 kilometers. 
It is also good to remember that the Finnish forests are natural commercial forests and they do not compete with agricultural land. This is different from most of the regions in the world, so it, it's not competing with agricultural land. Finnish forests are managed sustainably. Most of those are family-owned. We can trace the origin of Finnish wood, uh, Finnish wood and some 85% of Finnish forests are certified. 85% certified. Globally, mind you, the certification level is only about 10%. So we have very, very good raw material base here in this country, and we use it in a sustainable manner. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we did not complete the mill alone. Large investment project involves many parties. <coughs> Financiers, as mentioned in the beginning, is one element. Seamless collaboration is the key for success, and, and with many, many, many parties. The cooperation with national, regional and local authorities has been very constructive and appreciated. Our common target was to find new ways to implement a major investment in Finland as fluently as possible. A pilot initiative was started to show that large projects can be implemented in Finland rapidly and competitively. As an example of the results, the environmental permit was received in half the, time, uh, half the usual time. Processes run in parallel, not only sequentially. So processes in parallel, not sequentially, and that makes a difference. Logistics related to both raw materials and end products play a key role in large-scale industrial operation. Uh, we were pleased, to, pleased how development funding was eventually allocated from improvement, uh, for improvement of railways and roads in central Finland. Good development work was also done in Vosari Harbour, where, where, where uh, who have to deal with, with this new massive cargo increase. Then, ladies and gentlemen, some final remarks, concluding remarks. Uh, it's been up and running for months now. It is above ramp-up curve. It's been performing well and all the elements have been functioning well. So, so far, so good. And I firmly believe that forest industry in general, not only Anikoski Mill, but forest industry in general, has a bright future in this country and overall, not just in this country. It is in the core of sustainable bioeconomy. It is part of the solution, not part of the problem. We need smart investments to grow the bioeconomy. And here's a bit of a laundry list what is needed for this kind of investment, for example. First of all, you need competitive raw material base. You need a product where there is a good demand, for which there is a good demand. Of course, you need financial resources, your own and, and from funds, uh, funds sector, very, very profound planning. Pre-feasibility studies and, 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 and the rest of the planning cannot be underestimated. So, so it is a must. So, so good planning, open dialogue with members of the society, and finally, last but not least, it takes a hell of a lot of determination to make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, this closes my remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. Kari, thank you very much for an uh, extremely interesting journey you're actually describing. So far, so good and uh, bright future for the industry. And when we talk about the bright future for the industry, I have a pleasure to introduce Jennifer Holmgren, uh, who is the uh, CEO of Lancetec. And I've heard a lot of... Uh, fantastic things about you as well, among other things that you've been nominating for a leading person. What was it, in the U.S.? Or can you tell us a bit about that before you start? I think it's quite fascinating. <laughs> yeah? No, actually, um, I was... Uh, I was uh, uh, yeah, it, it was just a, a biofuels digest. I was the 
top person in the bioeconomy. She's been so modest. I think we should give her a applause for that. I mean, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, and I get to talk about my favorite topics, which is how to create disruptive innovation. Um, all right, one always starts with predictions, right? You always have to predict the future. So here you go. Well, perhaps not quite our future. Look at these. Less than 10 years from the time of Kitty Hawk, Lord Calvin, not just anybody, said there was no way we would ever put a plane up in the air. Lots of really interesting predictions about what we can do or what the future of computing will be. And my favorite prediction is this one. Bill Gates saying 640K of memory should be enough for anybody. <laughs> I suspect anybody under 30 doesn't even know what a K of memory is. <laughs> Um, so you ask yourself, how can these people, who are so brilliant, be so absolutely wrong? And in my mind, it's quite simple. The reality is that a prediction is nothing but an extrapolation of the past. The reality is when Bill Gates said that, what he was trying to tell his team is you need to learn to code tightly. You don't need more memory. Just code better. What he didn't know is that someday we would be carrying these things in our pocket. And because we were carrying them in our pocket, we would want our music, our videos, our photos in there, which means we needed memory. Innovation changes our world, changes what is possible, in fact, changes how we view the world. And therefore, as Alan said, we don't want to predict the future. We're here to create it. We are, in fact, in this room because we believe the future of carbon cannot look like the today of carbon. We need to change how we source, how we use, and how we dispose of carbon. In my mind, what we have to do is create what I call a carbon smart future a world where we keep fossils in the ground. But that's not easy. <laughs> Everything is made from fossils. Power, fuel, chemicals, our carpet fiber, our yoga pants, everything is made from fossil carbon today. So in my mind, to make a change, what we must do is start to segment the, the world of carbon. Energy can be carbon free. Carbon must be reserved for fuels and chemical production. And of course, we need to learn to recycle carbon. And that's what Lancet Tech does. What we do is we're carbon recyclers. Instead of fermenting sugar, we have a bacteria that ferments carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide. Where can those be found? industrial sites. Steel mills produce, have, have a gas that's 30, 40 percent carbon monoxide. Um, that's just a byproduct of making steel. These gases can be compressed, put into our bioreactor, and the bacteria can convert them to ethanol. We can make ethanol, we can convert the ethanol to jet fuel, we can also modify the organism to make chemicals, and most interestingly, the bacteria is a renewable resource. It grows on this carbon monoxide and divides, and we have to pull some out of the reactor so it doesn't plug. What that means is 85% protein in this bacteria. This is animal food. You can break the paradigm of food versus fuel and instead move to a world where you're making food and fuel. Now, I realize this sounds like science fiction, but it's not. We are, in fact, this is a 100,000 gallon per year demonstration facility in China that uses carbon monoxide at a steel mill to make ethanol. We have run that for 
a number of years. And what we're doing now is building commercial facilities. The first one there is at the exact same steel mill in China, Xiaogang. It should be mechanically complete next month. We are also working with one at ArcelorMittal that's part of Horizon 2020 program. And we're building one in South Africa at a ferro-alloy plant and one in India. The one in India is interesting because it's a very different gas stream. In a refinery, you have hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. 60% of the carbon in the ethanol in that India plant will actually be from carbon dioxide, direct carbon dioxide conversion. You can also gasify waste. There's a lot of carbon, as you all know, locked in biomass and municipal solid waste. So, <laughs> what does it take to get innovation like this out into the real world? The reality is even though we're building commercial plants, we will have proven our technology in the next couple of years at commercial scale. We've been around for 12 years, so consider it a 15-year cycle. Getting to the first commercial, many people call crossing the valley of death. Because if you're going to put $50 million into building a commercial plant, that's actually not trivial. And it also takes a lot of time to go from the lab to a pilot to a demo to a commercial. And it takes increasingly more and more money. I used to always say, everybody wants to be first to be second. <laughs> and so the reality is this valley is very difficult. After you build the first one, if you're trying to build a new technology platform, if you're trying to build a uh, company, you also have to be able to build a sustainable enterprise. That also takes time and money. So, talk about investment. Let me tell you what it takes to get here, okay? A little green four-leaf clover. It takes a lot of equity capital. We've raised $250 million of equity capital. It takes government support because sometimes the longer-term ideas require near-term government dollars, as well as JDA projects and partners. And it also requires the building of demos and pilots, which in our case have been financed by our partners. So you can see there's $400 million on that table. And that's without considering the first commercial plant, which actually um, is another 50 to 100. So I would tell you that if you're going to build a disruptive new technology, it's going to take you half a billion dollars, OK? Um, don't underestimate that. So the last topic I want to cover is policy. This is one of my favorite quotes. If you want to change the world, don't play in this field. Go to the next field. Jump to the next curve. And the problem is often policy is based on the incumbents. It's based on today's technology. It's based on what is known. This is actually a problem my company has had to deal with. You all know how it works. Industrial sites emit, emit carbon, carbon dioxide, which becomes particulates and other emissions. And that is then converted to biorefineries. This is beautiful. Stop and think about what a tree does, OK? It's got 400 ppm of CO2 in our atmosphere. It's able to filter that and grow. It's a miracle, OK? But we cannot create the future carbon economy on miracles. We have to go beyond that. This is important. This is a key contributor. But there are other ways. For example, what we do, carbon capture and reuse, we bypass the dilution effect of taking it into the atmosphere and diluting it with nitrogen and oxygen. And instead, we intercept it, recycle it, and make the same exact ethanol product. When we started doing this, everybody said, well, this is not biology, this is not bio, this ethanol is not a biofuel. And so we had to struggle with that. And a lot of it is because Policy is prescriptive. It makes lists of what is known and creates the table of what's allowed. And what you need to do is expand the possible so that just other technologies that you haven't considered, who will never make the list, are allowed. So you decide, what is it that you want to do? 
reduce carbon. The policy must enable that the market, all the ethanol is treated equally. And it has to enable risk financing. It has to enable Innofin. What EIB is doing is extremely important. How do you build the first of a kind? So I will show you just a little video. It, it, this will just take a second. Um, part of our problem is everybody sits and says, okay, let's give up on the bioeconomy because it's taken you 20 years. <laughs> well, it, technology doesn't grow linearly. Technology doubles. So I'm going to show you what happens if you use Moore's law. Okay, just watch this. If you start building computing power and you're filling Lake Michigan, see that? It's, you can't even see it's happening at the beginning, but as you double, boom, okay? That's what we're doing. And we will be successful, I guarantee you, if we have the right policy, if our investors continue to support us, and if all of you continue to have the brilliant ideas that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is getting better and better. So before we start with uh, the question session, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Alexander, you have any comment on this? I mean, this was really interesting. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was lovely. It, it's fascinating. I've been doing a lot of work in the past two years of trying to read on, on uh, I haven't found the right term for it. I think the fourth industrial revolution is somehow old fashioned. I mean, it's like a digital revolution in, in, in many ways. I think what Jennifer was touching was that. And, and just to, make you understand the magnitude of change. We have a tendency to exaggerate the crisis right now and somehow undermine or downplay the future. And I think we should look at it a little bit from the other perspective, because I, I think that this revolution, I mean, it has implications on economics. I actually think that it will have fundamental implications on liberal democracies as, as we know them. Uh, I also think that they have fundamental implications on, on, on medicine. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago in Switzerland, they managed to start printing what they call Flink, which is fluid ink, with which you can basically use a 3D printer mm. to print, for instance, intestines. Now, uh, a few years ago, transplants were not that commonplace, but in the future, you'll be able to basically inject. Mm. And, and that's where we come into huge ethical questions as well about the future of mankind. If you haven't read Harari's um, The Future of, uh, or the uh, Homo sapiens, A Short History, or Homo Deus, when human beings basically become singular with, with machines and, and sort of gods do it. But just to give you an indication of the ethical questions, we all think it's okay to do a heart transplant, right, to save a life. We think it's okay to take medicine to, to get better. And we also think it's okay to grow an ear on a mouse and then take that ear and transplant it on a human being who has an ear again. Or we're okay to change retinas or get people to hear again. But are we okay with gene manipulation and DNA restructuring of the genome when basically we can cure disease would you want your child to be, at the age of 10, a little bit more mathematically inclined? Probably yes. Or my parents wanted me to be at least, mm. but uh, would you be willing to give an injection so that that kid gets a substance that makes him or her a little bit smarter? Uh, is it okay to have an arm amputated and then have neural laces which can connect with that arm and make it work? Probably yes. It's much more convenient than being without an arm or having a robot arm. But who is the one who programs that? And what if the system collapses or there is a cyber attack on that hand and it starts to do something which you don't want it to do? So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, th this is the magnitude of thinking that we need to do. And just to tell you that Jennifer and I are not speaking, you know, UFO or SkyFi. Look at your phone. If, if you can all take out your phone at, at this moment. Because anyone who says nowadays that, you know, we're not hybrids or cyborgs with, with the phones. Look at what you had to buy in the 1990s. 
we're here on the bioeconomy. Say you still read a paper, right? A paper version of a paper, as my neighbor does, because he works for UPM. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but hypothetically, you get a Helsinki Sanomat, and you look at the ads that you would have had on the 90s. You would have probably had an ad on a paper calendar. You would have probably had an ad on photos. You would have had an ad on buying a camera. You would have had an ad on watches. You would have had an ad on maps. You would have had an ad on either CD players or amplifiers or speakers or notebooks or pens on calculators on video cameras. And what happens? It's all here right now. So that's why I fully agree with what Jennifer just said, that we seriously have to think big. We shouldn't exaggerate it. You know, it's not going to be like you and I are going to be boosted with some kind of uh, uh, injection Matrix, every, yeah. every 10 yeah. years, you know, Mr. Stubb, would you like to have green eyes for the next 10 yeah. years? Or, no, it, it's not going to happen that fast. But these are the types of questions that we're going to grapple with. And my final point is on Moore's law. Interestingly enough, Moore's law pertains to computing. But from what I understand, and if you talk to anyone in Silicon Valley or scientist, Moore's law in computing is coming to the end of the road. Because the compressor is getting so small that, that we, we can't make them any, any smaller at this stage. So that's why we're going to have to come up with different kinds of words. But just to also give another example on the implications of Moore's law, if the doubling of computing would have, from, from the 1970s to today would be juxtaposed to the speed of cars, we would next year come to the point when a car would be going around the world in a hundredth of a second, if cars would have developed as fast as computing did. So, you know, Thanks. it's Thanks. interesting examples. Thanks, Alexander. Yeah. Now we have a, this is a fantastic sort of a conclusion of, of the presentations. Uh, can we get a hands up and please, when you ask questions, be precise and concrete so we can get the answers out. So we have one person over there. Um, and we just have time maybe for about two, two or three quick questions. Two, two questions. Super, thank you. Madam, your name and your company. Johanna Bucher, Luke Finland. This Lancetec uh, example was a fascinating thing so that we have to think about the thing that we can make materials and things out of the atmosphere. And that creates pressure to the forest industry. So let's try to make out of the forest biomass something that really exploits the unique structure what nature has made. So do not split it into uh, monomers. Try to keep the fibro structure and create something out of that. Jennifer, any comments on that? Well, actually, I think that is a great comment because I think the point is really that different types of technologies and different types of approaches can contribute differently. And for example, the aromatics and other things that, that come from woody products are not things that you can build up easily from carbon monoxide. So it's a great point. And, and I think the answer is we need a diversity of thought, a diversity of solutions, and we should encourage as many to have a seat at the table. Thanks. We have a time for one more question. Don't be so shy, now you've got the chance. <laughs> Board of experts here, banker, former politician, author, he's got everything going for him. He should be able to answer anything. Huh. Thank you very much, Chris Paterman. We had the COP23 in Bonn a few weeks ago. There were 1,000 site events. Two of them dealt with the bioeconomy, one by the Nordic Council of Ministers and one by Brazil. I might be mistaken, but I have not seen any, any event on new technologies like that who would have a direct impact on the use of CO2 or, or carbonite. Why not? Uh, maybe I'm wrong, you know, but that's what I was there for, for a few days, but never, I didn't see anything. Yeah, so, so actually, um, you're right. It's just starting to kind of bubble up. It's fallen into the circular economy and carbon capture and reuse approaches. And you're seeing more and more of it. And actually, you'll see if you, there was a, an event by the World Business Council on Sustainable Development below 50 where um, CCS and CCUS approaches to make fuels and chemicals were discussed. 
but you're right, there isn't enough light on these approaches, but I, I'm starting to see more and more. Yeah, I, not specifically on that, but uh, we just had an EIB Financial Times um, conference in Brussels on, on, on Thursday. And one of the things I hadn't realized before, many of you probably in the room have, but whilst we speak about the onslaught of technology, we quite often think about it as something fantastic and clean and the rest of it. But as a matter of fact, technology can be as dirty uh, as uh, old industry. And I'll just give you one example. One Bitcoin transaction would basically heat up a house for half a month. And these are the types of issues that we're going to have to start grappling with when we're talking with climate change as well. And that's why I would certainly second uh, Jennifer's earlier comment that we need it as diverse as, as, as possible. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and take care, Alexander. Before the jo sort of a closing it up, as a, a short remark from my side as a banker. It's very little discussion on business case for bioeconomy. I haven't heard the word being used. I haven't heard it being discussed. I think in the next two years, maybe if we revisit the conference, we're going to be having a lot of speakers talking about the business case for it, because that's where it gets interesting. And I think that's not only the language issue, it's more issue of formatting and also presenting that as a business case. This is a huge opportunity. But bear in mind, most of the business cases are also linked to the time perspective and time horizon. And I think that what is happening in this particular field is it's actually pointing directions to us investors and bankers that there is a, a long time horizon for investments that we are not sort of a unlocking yet. And we will definitely be revisiting that. Thank you very much, can Jennifer. I, Thank can you, I Alexander. just on, on that yeah. point, because I did forget to say one thing. We're actually together with many instances building a, a platform or, or fund of sorts on by an economy and actually even looking for a fund manager for it at the moment. You might have heard that the EIB was the first multilateral bank, uh, IFI, to, to have a, a green bond. And we're doing the same thing, sort of funding system now for, for the bioeconomy side. And, and this platform, whatever you want to call it, will be established in the new year. So you might want to have a look at that one as well. Thank you one more time. Indeed, thank you all so much. And Sasha, thank you so much for moderating that session. Um, exciting news there on the fund on the bioeconomy. Um, we'll be interested to see what the press covers on this and how the press covers this. So I'm going I'm to take the hot seat now. And we have a little change in plan. Matthew Flamini, the flamboyant footballer himself, sends his regrets. He has been unable to make it. Um, no, you don't just get me instead. I'm going to be joined by a few colleagues here. But um, he's had a last minute problem and uh, couldn't make it. But instead, we're going to have a discussion on the media and just see what's going on. We've heard from many of you this morning, too, that uh, people don't know what's going on in this industry. Um, just there talking about the fund on the bioeconomy. The first time I've heard about it, this is something that should be in the headlines. This is something that people should be really looking at. <coughs> and excuse me, it really is uh, a matter of getting, <coughs> getting the media and getting me to... Uh, I haven't been talking that much today, and I'm suddenly losing my voice just when I need it most. That means I better get my panelists up here very, very quickly. So if I could um, call... Uh, James Astle, he's the Washington correspondent from The Economist. James, if you can join us, and he is in the house, I believe. Um, also joining us from BBC, the rural affairs presenter, uh, Tom Heap, who has been covering the environment for quite a while. And then we're also going to take a look and see how industry is looking at how the media is covering. So from UPM Biorefining, the executive vice president, Heike uh, Vapula, is joining us as well. So... Um, we're going to try and recycle a few glasses there. We're going to have a quick, almost like a bit of a talk show. Please, join me here. Um, in terms of what's going on here. Gentlemen, we heard this morning, uh, James, perhaps I'll start with you in terms of The Economist. A lot of people talking about the fact that this industry maybe is misunderstood. It's not making the headlines. Um, what's going on? Why are we not hearing more about the bioeconomy industry? Um, I don't think we hear. Can you hear me? Or you need that, okay. sorry. Is that on? Yeah. I don't think we hear, um, you know, I don't think we hear a tremendous amount about a whole gamut of environmental or environmental-related 
stories. I think that, by and large, uh, uh, we don't report, we the media at large, if you like, the Western media at large, don't uh, report uh, environmental related issues very deeply. And I think that we're particularly bad at reporting issues that are very interdisciplinary, that, that uh, uh, are very much, much of the in intersection between, in this case, technology and environmental policy and economics, um, uh, resource management, and so forth. Um, I think that The Economist is one of the outlets that does try to do that more than most. Actually, I mean, it's, it's very important for us um, to be, in that sense, interdisciplinary. And, and I think that the, the mix of talent that we have and actually the format of the, of the newspaper itself lends itself to that. We're quite kind of fluid across, you know, a science and technology section, a finance section, a business section, and the regional sections that we have. Um, but, um, you know, the constraints that we have, if you, again, take The Economist as an example, is that we, rep we try to report the world uh, and um, the bioeconomy, um, as I think, um, you know, more than one person today has mentioned, is, uh, is, is a long-standing idea, but which is, its um, development has been frustratingly slow. It's still quite niche in all of those different um, uh, areas of the economy that I and research that I mentioned. And so I don't think it's, it's sort of quite put its head above the parapet in terms of the popular media. You know, that said, I think there is, um, it, it, it's clearly of the future uh, and therefore uh, of great interest to publications like ours. We've written about it a bit. I've written about it and related things a bit. But those are a few reasons why perhaps it hasn't been covered as much as some would as we Tom, would all have liked. Yeah, talk to us, Tom, in terms of uh, television, in terms of good pictures, a good story. I mean, this sounds like it's got all going for us, but we don't. <laughs> it's not going to make uh, headline news, but it should be there. And I know you've been busy finding a few stories yourself, a few wow stories here. Why aren't we seeing more of it? I, I, I think when we're, we're not seeing more of it, maybe, uh, as James says, because it, it currently lacks a scale, but I, I think there are plenty of ways we could see more of it. And I think you have an awful lot going for you as, as, as an industry. The kind of media I do is general audience media. It's perhaps a little less um, targeted on the, uh, the, the, the finance community than The Economist uh, might be. And I, I think that you've got, as I say, you've got, you've got a lot of things going for you. And I, I'd say if I was going to you know, promote this uh, business in ways that I'm reporting it, you know, in telly terms, you've, you've got the beauty of, of, of forests themselves. You've got um, novelty. If you're get, getting something new out there, people are interested in that. And there are some extraordinary things we're hearing today, you know, everything from see-through wood to, you know, uh, bulletproof vests made of wood through to, um, uh, you know, catwalk fabrics and all these kind of things. And I think those kind of novelties and, and surprises are good. And you can play with cliches and expectations because wood is seen as a rather traditional old-fashioned material. You can double down on that and have some fun. You know, when people talk about wood clothing, it used to be, a, um, it used to be a, 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 another phrase for a coffin. You know, that's a wood <laughs> suit. Um, you know, you can, you can have some fun with these things. Uh, and uh, I, I just think um, you need to be... Uh, bold about what you're doing. You need to be a little bit mischievous, a little bit surprising every now and then. I mean, you, we've talked about, you know, the, the, the current problem with plastics, which certainly in Britain, I can't speak for the rest of Europe, is reaching a real kind of crescendo in the, in the media at the moment, particularly about marine plastics. You know, that is an opportunity a bandwagon which you should be leaping onto. You've got a real potential there. You know, don't just make a bag that doesn't harm a whale. Make a bag that actually feeds a whale. I don't know. It, you know it's not going to happen. Uh, it, it, I'm not suggesting that's going to be a, a big whale food. But if you made that, that would trend on Twitter. You know, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be in there getting a message across. The one thing I would, I would caution is there's one thing the media likes better than anything else. It's hypocrisy. So if you're caught saying one thing but apparently doing another. Also, you've got the history of biofuels part one, which wasn't that great in terms of biodiversity. You know, you will be scrutinised, you will be examined. I would like to know what these bottles are made out of. And if I was doing a news report on this or something that was really boosting up the question, I would be asking what these are made of. 
I have a feeling they are made of uh, oil and gas, but I don't know for a fact. Um, but beware of that kind of thing. If you're putting out an environmental message, you've got to be able to uh, live with it. At the same time, don't avoid controversy, because controversy is something that you know, gets you further up, the, further up the, the, uh, the bulletin or further towards the front page in, in newspaper terms. And later this evening, any of you have signed up, we are going to see that fabulous fashion show, product show, um, and everything, of course, coming from the bioeconomy. So that's going to be very exciting. I'm looking forward to that. Now, Heike, you have a big operation with, you do a lot with forestry. You've got the pictures, you've got the action, you've got the products. You, you've got everything going for you. But forgive me, um, and I'm delighted to, to meet you. Uh, this is the second time I've heard about your company. I heard about it last night. Why are we not reading more about this huge company that's a listed company that there's investors putting their money on that's been thriving for years that's just on the move and doing great things what, what's going on what are you doing to engage with the media I, I think we are trying to communicate quite a lot that maybe but maybe we are not uh, doing that well enough i i think the the story about the bioeconomy is a very simple story and it's a really beautiful story but journalists I, love simplicity. Yes, I actually have one, one picture that I, can, I could show here, which actually illustrates the, the core of the bioeconomy as we see it today. That, like Mr. Kari Jordan was saying, that it's a pulp production is at the heart of the bioeconomy. And, uh, and uh, this example just shows that by, by producing one ton of pulp, you need to use a bit more than five cubic meters of wood. But by using that wood, actually, what, what happens at the same time when while the forest is growing, it, it, it binds roughly 4,000 kilos of carbon. It purifies 8 million liters of water. It maintains biodiversity. It, uh, you know, there are 800 species of animals or, or, or bugs or whatever that are purely dependent on, on spruce and pine trees. 20,000 uh, species altogether in the Finnish forests. And it provides more than 200 kilos of food, 90 kilos of mushrooms, 30 kilos of berries, and one kilo of meat, game, game to be hunted during the lifetime of this uh, forestry that is uh, producing one ton of pulp. So this is only an environmental part of the story and you can elaborate that with the technology story, you can elaborate that with the rural community development story. There is always a business case behind it. There, is, there, is, there are many angles that you can, you can really tell this story, but, but the beauty of the story is here. It's uh, all bioeconomy is, is about making life better, more clean place to, to live. And I think that's the story very much that the viewers and the readers are looking for. James, what would you like to see this industry do and this community do that's going to make your life easier and maybe get stories out there to the fore? Because I bet there are a few that maybe you didn't know about even until you came here. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think that journalists really, if, they're, if, if journalists are writing for an audience that wants these stories and are working for editors that uh, want to encourage them to go and find these stories, there's, there's plenty of data and there's plenty of information out there. I don't think it's, I mean, companies have front offices, they, they have press offices and communications teams, but I don't think the failure of the media to popularize this, this issue is a failure of companies' own communications efforts. Do you think some journalists the, I are think a bit that, lazy? I think that, well, journalists are traditionally extremely lazy, but, but that, no, that's not the point I'm making, funnily enough. <laughs> the, 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 the media industry is, is in crisis. Um, so, so uh, resources are always an issue, but we, we simply don't have tr a tradition across the popular press of writing seriously about technology and environmental issues. The, let, let me just, because I think some people in the room might be interested, people are interested in The Economist sometimes because we, we, uh, uh, we're, we're more secretive than some outlets, I think, just by virtue of not having bylines. Um, we uh, are very interested in the future, and we're always very interested in big ideas that predict or provide a guide to the future. So this is absolutely the sort of issue that we're interested in. And just in terms of our readership, traditionally, and we've been writing about uh, 
the environment, especially around the climate, for you know a long time. I think um, quite seriously for a long time. Traditionally, those covers have done about as well as our business covers, which do on average about 15 to 20 percent less well than our politics covers. Although we're called the Economist, and although people often think of us as a finance business publication, actually we write about general politics more than we write about finance and, and business. But that is, I think, changing, and it's changing in a way that's not only should be encouraging for everybody in this room, but it's actually quite encouraging for the economists, because we want funky, young readers, well-educated uh, readers with inquiring minds who are interested in how the world's changing. And those readers are most interested in these stories. And our environment covers are, consequently, doing increasingly well. The one that perhaps some people in this room um, saw, I think it was three or four weeks ago, on uh, negative emissions, on the insufficiency of um, current climate policies to meet the Paris targets, and therefore the inevitability, if those targets are real, to start sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, not just reducing our emissions. That, that cover was one of the best-selling issues that we've had this year. And that factoid alone, to me, is quite encouraging. Um, yeah, please, and also just to carry on with your thought, but also come uh, into this, Tom, in terms of looking at the products that we saw downstairs, some of the products and the goods and the fabrics and all that we're going to see maybe later this afternoon. That's the type of oh-wow stuff that, yeah. that the audience is going to like. I, I come on to that in a second. One, yeah. one thing I was just thinking uh, was that uh, a problem that you've got and that press offices, I think, in companies don't always understand is reflected by uh, a hard-bitten news editor of mine once, a uh, traditional old hack. He said, you know, it was actually about farming, but it applies to you just as He said, I'm delighted if farmers are doing good business, but it's not very interesting, is it? And, you know, that is a, a problem. If, if a lot of companies will put out stuff, and it may work on some of the, you know, financial reporting pages, but as a story... It doesn't work, so you've got to try harder than that. It is about novelty, it is about mischief, it's about beauty, it's about surprise. Um, occasionally it's about controversy, and I think I'd like to see more involvement of some of the NGOs in this, because either in maybe you know, holding your feet to the fire occasionally, making sure you're living up to the things that, that were, were, were promised in that slide, which are, which are very impressive, as long as they're there, um, but also occasionally maybe you know, if they're coming over to your side, if they've, you know, they've decided that absolutely they're going to sign up for productive forestry, that, that's, that's a great thing. On your point, there's nothing... For, certainly for the general media, and I think it's probably true for all media, actually, nothing that beats physical examples. Don't talk about, you know, bioproducts of some, some, you know, something, something off streams. You know, talk to me about what it is you actually could be made with those things or is being made with those things. Have more products on, you know, on show uh, down below. You know, uh, um, uh, just the, the sort of... It works in two ways... One, it actually gives the journalist something to, you know, touch, see, smell and hear, but also it kind of proves that something is actually happening and that it's not just, you know, aspirations, but you've actually gone as far as physically doing something. And I think, you know, put those things together and, and, and I think we could be seeing a, a lot more of the bioeconomy. One other thing I was just going to mention, you know, the one thing we do love in the media is, 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 is bogeyman, and in this case the bogeyman is, is the fossil fuel industry and you are hopefully, on a regular basis, helping to slay that bogeyman. <laughs> Tell me a little bit in terms of, you know, what you see the benefit of the media in terms of getting your message out there, and how has it been useful to you, perhaps? Uh, has it always been understanding? Have they always got the message right? Uh, no, we, we don't get the message always right, but media is extremely important to us, as, as well as politics, because whatever we do, has, is, is, has a long-term nature and it's very capital intensive. We are, we are, for example, planting a tree worldwide every minute, uh, a football field full of trees every minute. So it's a, we, we are dealing with a lot of lo every local... Every minute, a football minute. field of trees every minute. Every minute. Oh, I and then have done we, that as a banner, you know, across this yeah, room. Somewhere. Well, yes, yes, and, uh, and we... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it's, it's worldwide, not, not only in this country. But it means that we need a lot of media attention. We, not a lot, we need a lot of local community attention in, in those places that we operate in. Uh, and and I, I believe that we are dealing with a lot with the media. And, uh, and, and just to give you an example, we, we, are, we are dealing with a quite a large project currently in Uruguay. In, uh, 
and that's quite a lot of in the local media there. We 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 have been uh, uh, during last 18 months on the average 10 articles per day oh. in, in 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 media in different television channels, news newspapers and radio radio channels. So it's a it's been I, I believe that there's been a little bit too much media <laughs> at, attention, and, but it's it's been luckily. Uh, mostly positive, 80 uh, percent positive media attention. So, so media is important to us, and politics is important to us because w whatever we do, whatever regulation the politics are doing, they, it needs to be lasting for 30 to 50 years. Otherwise, we cannot do business. And uh, and this is really long-term thing to and, and takes a long, lot of patience to develop and finance and and to invest in. No, we just we do have to just wrap it up. So, your closing thought on this one. I know this is the express panel. So, um, but we just wanted to give you a flavor. Um, a word of advice, perhaps, to any of the companies out there, to any of the NGOs, to any of the people, perhaps, from both of you, in terms of how they might be able to help you, your colleagues in the media, maybe get their stories to the fore. What would you like to see, Tom? Well, I've given a few, few thoughts already in, in terms of what I think your assets are. Um, you know, be bold, capitalize on the, the, the beauty of what you're doing, talk about the biodiversity of what you're doing. Don't be af occasionally afraid to talk about the sort of blunders or how you've, you can dress it up in how you've learnt um, and those kind of things, those are good. The one other thing I haven't mentioned just is human stories. Every journalist of every type still likes a human story. So if within your company you have, you know, someone who's gone from being you know, uh, a traditional uh, you know, axe-wielding forester into someone who's now at the cutting edge, if you pardon the pun, of the, uh, of, the, of the new generation of materials. You know, those kind of things that all really, really work. Uh, and so, yeah, don't forget the humanity in any story or how your product has affected um, an individual or, or a village's life or, you know, maybe somewhere in Uruguay or Brazil or indeed, indeed Finland. And, Tom, also for you, of course, it's, it's, it's television. It needs... Pictures, yep. sounds, yep. action. Yeah, yep. all those so things. So no point know. doing a meeting in an office and telling you about it. Uh, absolutely, absolutely not. For radio, you can do a little bit, but even for radio, we want to get out on location a lot of the times. We're going out tomorrow to because I am making a radio program here to 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 the mill. Um, but for television, you know, most definitely uh, pictures will work. But in my opinion, there's a few better pictures than forest harvesters. They're like something out of the Matrix. They're absolutely fantastic. So that's always a winner with me. I'll, I'll, I'll just say very briefly um, that that you know, we've heard so many gripping stories um, today. You know, in, in not a full day of of, of conference, the the drama that, that surrounds this entire transition that we're talking about. It's so, it's so monumental. I don't think there's a, a, a shortage of good stories out there. And I think that in all of the kind of micro details, what individual companies are doing, the kinds of research um, that are, are being ventured already are so gripping that, that you know, if we have a, a, a lively, interested media industry, these stories almost tell themselves. And therefore, my advice to you is not to worry an awful lot about your communication strategy, but to buy read, advertise in good newspapers and magazines. And with Christmas coming, I recommend that you all get your children's subscriptions to The Economist. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm leaving you the last word, Haikan. That well, he was close to getting I, the last word, but I, I'm not letting him have it. I couldn't agree <laughs> more with you, James. <laughs> but quickly, what, what, what would you like? What can the media do to help this sector? What more can it do? Because while you, know, you may be getting your 10 stories a day in Uruguay, you know there are many other people um, and perhaps the industry is not getting enough attention. What could they do? Do real things. So that's the starting point of everything. So you you need to do real things and not 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 build any cloud castles. Yep. So it's it's again it comes down to action. Yes. Super. Okay. Well, we leave there. Thank you for taking the time. Sorry, it's been the speedy one. It's something for you to think about over coffee now, and uh, we will have you all back here. Um, at uh, just before 3.30, okay? We want to get this started before 3.30. Quick coffee break, and again, thank you all, guys. Thank you so much.